speaker for today, Dr. Jen Dion, who's coming from Stanford University. She's very well known for her work on synthesis and optical applications and, and, and um, studies from up conversion to quantum dots. And I'm very excited to hear what you will present to us today. So please, the stage is yours. I'll use this one. It won't reach. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry that you had to skip dessert, but hopefully I'll make this talk short and sweet. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to be here. I'd like to thank the organizing committee and especially Jorge for such an incredible conference. I've only been to a handful since um, travel between borders opened up and I have to say this has been the best conference I've attended, I think in my entire career as a scientist. So thank you so much, even with the rain. <laughs> um, so I apologize that my abstract is on uh, photocatalysis. I decided with all the incredible biology talks, I wanted to share with you some of the work that my lab was doing on detecting biomarkers. And in particular, I want to share with you some new nanophotonic platforms that we're developing for both environmental and human health monitoring. And hopefully at some point, you'll all have the opportunity to come visit Stanford, and in particular my lab, the Dione Lab or the D-Lab. And I think what we are really passionate about in our laboratory is developing new methods to both detect molecules and also direct their transformations. And since there are many students in the audience, many of them ask, like, how is it that you knew you wanted to get into nanoscience and into nanophotonics? Well, I certainly didn't always know it was the case. I grew up on the east coast of the United States in a small state called Rhode Island. Uh, my parents were not scientists. They uh, were construction workers and nurses. So my love of science came from special agents Fox Mulder and Dana Scully in watching the X-Files. So for many years, um, I wanted to be a paranormal researcher. I thought it was really cool that here was a doctor um, and a scientist who were able to work together and solve mysteries as a team on nearly a daily basis. And while my career paths have changed, uh, you know, obviously I'm not a paranormal researcher, um, I guess my love of um, Hollywood and performing is still entertained by my students where we'll get to go out disco roller skating. Um, I moved to Caltech for my PhD um, and got to meet some science stars along the way, including Stephen Hawking, um, and kind of given my love of Hollywood, also get to meet the uh, myth Busters folks, Jamie and Adam. So it's been so fun uh, doing science and especially connecting science with the arts. Um, and part of our work that was in my abstract that I won't be presenting on today is how we can make kind of movies of molecular interactions. And I love this work because it's very artistic, but it also addresses some critical energy challenges, in particular, trying to develop catalysts that are engineered at the atomic scale to enable both high yield photocatalysis and also product selective photocatalysis. And what we've done is try to link reactor scale properties with the atomic scale structure of these catalysts. And to get atomic scale insight, we use in situ transmission electron microscopy. If you do come to Stanford, you'll get to see our Titan environmental transmission electron microscope. So unlike most TEMs that just operate under vacuum, this one can operate under reactive gaseous conditions, also in liquid environments. And then we can also send in a range of optical inputs and also do optical spectroscopy. And just to show an example of the sorts of work that we do, we're able to uh, look at hydrogenation-based reactions in small palladium-based and biometallic-based nanoparticles. So what you're seeing in the movie here is basically a reaction of hydrogen splitting and then intercalating into the palladium nanoparticle. And what we can do with atomic scale resolution is, especially in biometallic nanoparticles, figure out which atom is where and then link what we see both in the TEM to calculations, first principles calculations, of the excited state property. So what you'll see on the top is basically a kind of full atomistic simulation of the excited state of a palladium silver nanoparticle. And right where there's the silver, you can see there's kind of a higher concentration of the electron density. So that's part of my group's work, but today is really focused on more of the detection of molecules rather than the directing of molecules in photocatalysis. 
And on the detection side, I wanted to motivate it by thinking about biology and just the richness of data that's in biological systems. And I know it's after lunch and we're all kind of tempted to take a nap, but kind of a pop quiz, how much data do you think is in one milligram of biological material? So if we had a snowflake size worth of, say, DNA, how much data would be stored in there? Any guesses? Thousands or millions of what? <laughs> Units are important here. <laughs> Gigabyte, I love it. Good, good guess. Any other guesses? Maybe from this side of the room. Terabyte. 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 Oh my gosh. Okay, gigabytes, terabytes. Um, actually, we've got an exabyte, which is 10 to the 18 bytes. This is an enormous amount of data that's stored in such a small amount of biological material, and it's more than all of the data that's generated every day by Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft combined. And if you were to take today's top of the line hard drives, which are about 20 terabytes, you'd have to stack them up to three times the height of Mount Everest just to be able to reproduce the amount of data in biological material. And just to put some numbers on these things, if we think about the human body, there's about a trillion cells, over 63,000 genes, um, about 200,000 proteins that all can fold and have different post-translational modifications, giving rise to roughly 10 to the 130 proteoforms and over 40,000 metabolites. So not only a ton of data in a small biological material, but if we really want to understand human, animal, and environmental health, we need to find some way to kind of quickly read out all of the data that's contained in all of these biomarkers. And if we think about the fastest technologies out there with which to read biological information, the fastest is for sure nucleic acid sequencing. Um, we can sequence DNA at a rate of about 400 bytes per second. And to put that number in context, the average you know, high-speed internet um, speed down a fiber optical cable is orders of magnitude faster, 100 megabytes per second. So the fastest reading ability we have for biomarkers is still orders of magnitude slower than the typical internet speed that we're able to get. And then, like I said, when we think about the proteins, metabolites, and the millions of cells, those are all read currently at much slower states. So what I hope to share with you this afternoon is three vignettes on how we're trying to expedite this reading of biological data from the cellular level to the molecular level. And in the first vignette, I'll share with you how we can use light and spectral shaping to rapidly identify pathogen cell species and strains and their drug susceptibility. Then in the second vignette, I'll shift gears a bit and I'll share with you how we can develop nanoparticles that can detect um, the forces in biological systems, sharing you how we can read out the forces um, inside C. elegans worms using some of the lanthanide nanoparticles that we heard about this morning. And then in the final part of my presentation, I'll share with you how we can rapidly read out different molecular biomarkers, including DNA and proteins and metabolites, using high-quality factor metasurfaces. So in the first few minutes, I want to discuss bacterial infections and pathogen detection. And they may not often make headlines. In fact, we spent two years thinking about viral infections. Um, but bacterial infections have a global impact. Um, and if we think about uh, developing countries, more than 30% of all deaths are due to a bacterial infection. If we think about one example of a bacterial infection, tuberculosis, more than 10 million new cases of tuberculosis emerge each year. And because antibiotics are so overprescribed now, by 2050, the World Health Organization predicts that antimicrobial resistance and multi-drug resistance will be the leading cause of death, so over 10 million deaths per year just due to antimicrobial resistance. And that's because over um, prescription of antibiotics arises from the long culture times needed to be able to identify whether or not you have uh, bacterial infection. So more often than not, they won't even take a culture. They'll just assume, well, if you do have a bacterial infection, let's give you an antibiotic and hopefully it'll clear up. And if it doesn't clear up, then we know it wasn't bacterial. So what is the gold standard to identify pathogens in a range of samples? And keep in mind, those samples could be a human sample, like a, a nasal pharyngeal swab or a sputum sample. They could also be environmental samples. So you could be looking at pathogens, for example, in wastewater to do human health monitoring. Or you could be looking at phytoplankton in the ocean. So usually you'll go and collect the samples, 
And depending upon where the sample is from, there could be anywhere from just a few up to a few tens of thousands of bacteria per milliliter. Then what they'll do is culture the cells, and depending upon the type of bacteria it is, that could take anywhere from 24 hours up to 40 days in the case of tuberculosis. And then once the cells are cultured, they can usually use molecular methods or mass spectrometry um, to be able to identify what sort of pathogen it is. And then they'll screen for antibiotic susceptibility. So they'll take the culture of bacteria, they'll put antibiotics on top, and they'll see where the bacteria are dying. So according to the CDC, worldwide, over 50% of patients are unnecessarily treated with antibiotics or are treated with the wrong type or dose. So bacteria can be engineered to have different colors, but in their natural state, for the most part, they're colorless. So how can we use something about the optical information of bacteria in order to identify their species, their strain, and their antibiotic susceptibility? Well, this morning we heard a beautiful talk um, from Dr. Sutton, who was speaking about mid-infrared vibrational spectroscopy. In our case, we're also using vibrational spectroscopy, but at visible frequencies, Raman spectroscopy. And for students in the audience who maybe need a little bit of a primer, Raman scattering is an inelastic photon scattering process. So if we take, just for example, water, and we illuminate it with a monochromatic light source like a laser, the molecular vibrations are going to scatter light to different frequencies, and we can basically use that scattering to different frequencies as a fingerprint of what the molecule is. So water is quite simple. You can kind of think about most bacteria also as kind of just bags of water with a bunch of like lipids and proteins that are all decorating the cell surface as well as all the contents that are within inside the cell. And our kind of hypothesis now about five years ago was that we could use Raman scattering as a unique identifier of what each cell species and strain was and potentially also its antibiotic susceptibility. So what we did is collect single cell bacterial species and we started off with the 30 species that were most commonly seen at Stanford Hospital. Um, so we collected single cell spectra, um, over about 1,000 single cell spectra in this particular paper. And you can see that the Raman scattering signatures for certain bacteria like E. coli and pneumonia look pretty similar. But then for other bacteria, like comparing E. coli and strep, look quite different. And if you just want to compare eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells, so for example, red blood cells and bacteria, you can do a principal component analysis and the Raman spectra are very distinct from each other in part because the sizes are different, the constituents are different. But if you try to identify those 31 bacterial species and strains using a principal component analysis, you can see there is quite a bit of clustering and it becomes a little bit more challenging to disentangle where you might find those different strains. So we adopted some of the conventional machine learning algorithms that are used now in, say, a Google image search, basically to train a neural network on the spectra rather than on images. So what we did is we took our Raman spectra, which is 1,000 wave numbers long, and we fed it into a convolutional neural network. And what gets output at the end of that convolutional network is a series of predictive scores. So you get to figure out what is the probability of some new spectra coming in being, for example, E. coli or Staph aureus or pneumonia or strep um, group B. So we train the neural network on 60,000 spectra from those 31 species and strains. And then we tested it on 12,400 spectra, all of which the neural network hadn't seen before. So we knew the ground truth from mass spectrometry, and then we took the Raman and were able to train the neural network and then also feed it new spectrum. And I'm going to plot the results in this part of my presentation in a confusion matrix. So along the um, rows, you'll see what we know the ground truth to be from mass spectrometry. And then along the columns, you get to see what is the predicted score from the Raman combined with the neural network. And if the neural network is doing a really great job, most of the scores are going to be along the diagonal. But if there are any misclassifications, those misclassifications will be along the off-diagonal elements. So you can see here for Staph aureus, Staph epidermis, and MSSA, there's quite good classification accuracies. There are some mishits. So for example, that third strain of Staph aureus is 3% of the time misclassified as what we're calling an isogenic strain of the methicillin-resistant methicillin Staph aureus strain. Now, isogenic being basically a gene has been engineered to take the resistant version and now make it susceptible to the first-choice antibiotic. <clears throat> 
And if we look at all of the 30 species and strains, on average, the accuracy that our neural net had obtained back when we did this work in 2019 was about 82.4%. But what matters really in a clinical setting is what is the accuracy for um, first choice antibiotic or first choice empiric um, drug choices. And what I've done here is by color group all of the pathogens based on what antibiotic a clinician would be most likely to prescribe based upon your symptoms. So for example, um, all of the um, bacteria shown in the top row, so MRSA, Staph epidermis, those are all treated with the same first choice antibiotic. And if we think about the treatment accuracies within those groupings, it was over 97%. So the exciting thing is that this Raman spectroscopy combined with machine learning didn't work only on cell line samples. It also worked on clinical spectra that we obtained from patients at Stanford Hospital. So what we did is start fine-tuning our neural network as we started to look at clinical samples that were coming from Stanford's clinical microbiology lab. And we were able to correctly predict most of the spectra first time around, although there were some suboptimal predictions. That means basically instead of choosing the first choice antibiotic, we came up with the second or third choice antibiotic. And then you can see on some of the clinical samples with MRSA, there was also some kind of misfires or it was uh, inappropriately categorized as MSSA. But as we kept training our neural network on more clinical data, so adding up to 60 patients in this first paper, the neural network was able to get more accurate, so we had less misclassifications. So this was pretty exciting. And a question we had after that work is, can we extend this now to bacteria that have extremely long culture times and that are huge drivers of antibiotic resistance due to overprescription of antibiotics. And tuberculosis is kind of the key class of bacteria where it takes 40 days to culture and drug-resistant tuberculosis is emerging as um, a global health epidemic. If you look at different strains of tuberculosis in SEM or in optical microscopy, by and large, they all look very similar. Um, but it turns out Raman spectroscopy is actually a really great way of identifying without culturing um, can you, uh, or the drug susceptibility. So what we did is we took um, tuberculosis and we uh, have both the wild type, um, that is um, the uh, susceptible uh, TB strain, and then we also cultured um, TB strains um, under different antibiotic conditions, so that way we knew if the bacteria were going to be resistant or susceptible to four of the main antibiotics used for tuberculosis, including amikacin, moxiflacin, isonazid, and rifampicin. And then again, we collected single cell spectra. And the cool thing about tuberculosis, as you can see in the images here, is that it's actually quite large. So if you're in the global south and you want to do TB diagnostics, usually you can tell from a sputum sample that a patient right away has TB, but it's that lengthy wait time to know which antibiotic to prescribe that's really challenging. So if you look at the Raman spectra, you can see just comparing the wild type or the susceptible TB with the rifampicin resistant, overall the spectra look quite similar, but there is this peak just above 1,000 inverse centimeters that starts to appear um, for the wild type, but is no longer present in the rifampicin resistant case. And again, if we collect spectra across all of the different antibiotic resistant strains, we can see some subtle differences. Most of them correspond to CC and CO stretches that correspond to mycolic acid. So basically in drug-resistant tuberculosis, the mycolic acid cell wall becomes a bit thicker. And again, we can train a neural network with just 15 second acquisition times on individual cells. We can determine with more than 95% accuracy which antibiotic should be prescribed for tuberculosis. So you might be asking now, how can we do this on more complex samples besides just sputum samples where you can use visual identification or a rapid PCR to identify that it's there? My student, Furi Hasafir, was co-advised with Pierre Curry Jakob, and she's been working on ways to process samples, including wastewater and blood samples, using an acoustic bioprinter. So here you put the sample in an open well, it's on a piezoelectric transducer, and by applying a voltage to the transducer, basically small droplets get ejected from the well, and this allows you to print essentially at kilohertz rate, so it's an extremely fast printing process, and she can make very small droplets that encase just a few cells. So in this case, each droplet has picoliter volumes, and you can see here she printed a subset of the Stanford logo. 
from combinations of red blood cells with bacteria in it. And acoustic printing maintains cell viability, so even if you wanted to do culturing after printing, you still could to increase your signal to noise ratio. So here she printed E. coli colonies on an agar-coated slide, and you can see where the bacteria continue to divide and multiply with time. So if we bioprint samples that contain red blood cells plus bacteria, including E. coli as bacteria um, and Staph aureus um, as bacteria, as well as mixtures of those, what we can do is print many droplets, use Raman spectroscopy, either of the individual droplets or of hyperspectral imaging of the features we know to be important for identification, and then again train our neural network to be able to identify is there a bacteria in the sample or not. So here are some of the example Raman spectra that come from droplets either of pure samples, say pure red blood cells or pure bacteria, or mixtures of both of those. And then with our neural network, we're able to get over, um, at this point, 77% accuracy in identifying complex mixtures of milliliters of liquid, whether or not there are of order about 1,000 colony forming units um, in the sample. And the neat thing about the neural network is it doesn't only tell you what is the accuracy of there being a pathogen, but I think there's also a fun way to use vibrational spectroscopy now to inform new biology. So what we can do is look at the features that are most important for classification. And you can see, for example, that the accuracy of classification drops down as you remove certain features from the spectra. So that tells you that those features are the most important for classification. And the neat thing is that can then inform not only what vibrations are important for the classification, but also what might be involved in, for example, new drug-resistant pathways that are evolving. Okay, so that is uh, vignette one. Um, I wanna switch gears a bit and tell you a bit now, not so much how we can use kind of the forces of molecular vibrations to change light, but how we can use light as a readout of forces in biological systems. And mechanical forces abound in nature, whether you're thinking about just muscle contraction or if you're thinking about stem cell differentiation or something that we've all thought about for the past two years, our immune synapses and basically how our immune cells can interact with each other to evoke an immune response. And if we think about the landscape of optical force sensors that are out there, for the most part, optical sensors are the most promising, including fret tethers or quantum dots or plasmonic nanoparticles or molecular rotors. And we've heard some really beautiful talks on individuals who are using quantum dots and lanth uh, lanthanide nanoparticles and fret tethers basically to understand um, not only uh, cellular interactions but also forces. But in the case of optical force sensing, many of these sensors start to contend with tissue autofluorescence also photo bleaching, a low dynamic range, and a pure intensity range. And especially if you want to do in vivo force imaging, you don't just want to have a change in intensity because that might mean, well, your organism has moved around or maybe your laser power has changed. So what we wanted to do is develop a stable optical force sensor that was de um, deployable in vivo, um, had a relatively large dynamic range, at least over the range of forces that were relevant between cells and between organisms, and also instead of a pure intensity change, had some sort of color change, whether that's a spectral change or in our case it turns out a ratiometric change. And we've heard a lot of beautiful work on lanthanide doped upconverting nanoparticles during this presentation. Um, the nanoparticles that we work with absorb at 980 nanometers and emit at a host of visible frequencies. Um, and as you all know, like they can be used for deep tissue imaging, which um, is pretty exciting for developing an in vivo force sensor. So I'll skip over the energy ladder diagram since that was shown quite a bit in this morning's presentations. The only thing I'll mention is that most of the ions that we're going to work with in the next um, handful of slides uh, use ytterbium as the sensitizer, so ytterbium to do all of the infrared absorption, and then erbium to do the visible emission. And erbium um, emits largely in the green and in the red. So um, the red wavelength is centered at about 650 nanometers, whereas the green wavelengths are centered right around 530 nanometers. And if you want to be able to develop an in vivo force sensor, you need to have a bright nanoparticle. Um, and we heard from yesterday's plenary talk, um, Professor Meyerink, how you can use a core shell system to increase the brightness and basically reduce the phonon modes. 
In our case, we can um, tweak the architecture so we don't only have ytterbium and erbium doped homogeneously into a ceramic lattice, but we can also think about how we kind of core and shell the ytterbium and erbium to kind of maximize the energy transfer between those ions while also maximizing the absorption. So in this case, we have ytterbium kind of doped homogeneously and at very high concentrations in a ceramic host lattice, usually sodium yttrium fluoride, and then coated with a thin erbium shell and then coated on top of that with an optically inert shell. And that significantly improves the brightness of our nanoparticles. We can also increase the brightness by using new host lattices. So sodium yttrium fluoride has been the workhorse host lattice for many years. Um, in the past few years, my lab has actually switched to using a strontium uh, yttrium fluoride host lattice in order to increase the brightness. That basically tunes the phonon mode so that way you can get higher efficiency up conversion. And it modifies the up conversion efficiency so much that you can actually get really bright three photon emissions. So in this case, going from 980 nanometers to the ultraviolet. And then it turns out this will be quite important for force sensing um, to further increase the brightness. And it turns out also to increase the force sensitivity, you can introduce different D-metal dopants. And on Thursday in the bio session in this room, you can hear from uh, my postdoc, Dr. Parivash Moradafar, who's used D-metal dopants, including um, cerium, to increase the radiative right, uh, rates of these nanoparticles. And she's actually been using them not so much for upconversion, but for scintillation, so developing new PET detector images using D-metal dopants in some of these uh, rare earth dope nanoparticles. Okay, so if we want to make a good force sensor, if we're just relying on the F ions, we know that those F electrons are very well shielded from their environment, so we're not going to have a very good force sensor because any change in the crystal lattice is not going to significantly impact those F electrons. But if we put in some of those D metals that not only help make the nanoparticle lattice a little bit brighter because you can change the energy transfer rates, we know that those D metals are also very diffuse or they have electron orbitals that are very diffuse, so they're going to be more sensitive to the surrounding environment. And to illustrate that, here I've shown an erbium oxide and an erbium chloride lattice, and you can see they're just kind of pale pinkish or pastel colored salts. But if you switch to a D metal and have that same oxide lattice or that same chloride lattice, you can see how vividly the color changes by virtue of those degenerate um, D orbitals mixing with kind of their surrounding crystal field. So what we do is we take the ytterbium and erbium as the sensitizer and the emitter for up conversion, and then we add in a D metal dopant, in this case manganese, and uh, the manganese has an energy level that's very closely aligned with one of the erbium energy levels. And when there's an applied pressure or an applied force, basically that energy level moves above one of the erbium energy levels and basically changes the red to green ratio. So we can turn on or off the energy transfer between the erbium and between the manganese. And those are doped in different host lattices in some of the first um, works I'll show you. We worked with that sodium yttrium fluoride host lattice that was doped with the ytterbium, the erbium, and the manganese. More recently, though, we switched to that strontium yttrium fluoride host lattice. So in some of our early studies, we calibrated the force sensitivity using a diamond anvil cell. We put the nanoparticles in between two diamonds and it basically illuminated them in the near infrared, looked at the emission as we pressed on the particles with the diamond, and then we had basically a calibration um, crystal inside the diamond anvil cell so that we knew exactly what pressure was being applied. And as we're applying the pressure or the force, you can see as you increase the force, basically these upconverting nanoparticles change the ratio between the red and the green in a linear fashion. Um, it's also very repeatable. And the red to green ratio change results in a perceivable color difference. So you can see that viewing the nanoparticles through the diamond anvil cell gives rise to a yellowish or greenish color at low pressures and then an orangish color at higher pressures. And then what we can do is map um, the forces within an organism, in this case C. elegans, with high resolution. So we decided to work with C. elegans in part because 80% of the genes of this small roundworm are homologous to humans, and it also has a very indiscriminate palate. So it normally eats bacteria, but you can just sprinkle the nanoparticles on top, um, and it'll basically eat up the bacteria plus the nanoparticles. And here's a confocal image showing those upconverting nanoparticles within the worm.
So when you feed the nanoparticles to the worm, basically once they're excreted, you can collect them and you can see they almost look better after the digestion process than before. That's because a protein corona is forming and we heard from Terry Odom yesterday about how those protein coronas will form. But we noticed that the signal to noise ratio we were getting wasn't quite as high as we would have expected, especially if we want to do real time or video rate imaging. So my student Jason Kazar, who also is presenting on Thursday in this session, um, figured out that C. elegans has a filter that actually filters out particles that are below the size scale of the bacteria. So he basically developed polymeric nanoparticles that could encapsulate his lanthanide dope nanoparticles so that way the size scale of the polymeric nanoparticles more closely matched that of the bacteria so that way he could start doing video rate imaging. So he'll show you on Thursday some of his uh, synthesis plus his um, cross sections of the bright nanoparticles which you can see here contrasted in white in the polymer polymeric host or microparticle. In feeding these to the nanoparticles, he found that there's no cytotoxicity. He could do still images of the forces in the worms, um, in particular looking at the grinder, which is kind of like the teeth of the worm, and comparing that to the pharyngeal intestinal valve. And you can actually see that nice color gradient across the worm corresponding to force. But I think most excitingly, and I don't want to steal his thunder, he's able to do uh, video rate imaging of the upconverting nanoparticles in the worm. So he can look at changes in the red to green ratio, both within the grinder and in the pharyngeal intestinal valve. And simultaneously, he can read out electrical recordings from the worm. So it's called an electropharyanogram. So he can see how the change in force corresponds with the electrical signal that the worm is basically giving to chew and digest its food. So definitely come to his talk if you want to learn more about that work. And what we're really excited to do is now take some of the work that Jason and his colleagues have done in having these bright force-sensitive nanoparticles for in vivo deployment and kind of understand how they can work to monitor cell forces, in particular the forces between two immune cells, like a T cell and a B cell, to understand immune synapses, which can last for over six hours. And then we've also taken insights from the worm, which is essentially a hollow organ, and adapted that now to understanding mammalian systems, like the colon, for example. So we have a collaborator, um, Julia Kalchmidt, who's a neuroscientist interested in understanding the combination of electrical and neural firing in um, mouse colons. And here's an excised mouse colon. It's part of the enteric nervous system, so it still kind of fires on its own, even when it's outside the organism. And what she had been doing is just looking at how fecal pellets kind of move through the enteric nervous system and kind of visually mapping out the extension. But these upconverting nanoparticles can also be doped into polymeric hosts that now give her a much higher um, and more sensitive readout, much higher uh, spatial resolution and more sensitive readout of what the forces are. Okay, so I think I have about 10 more minutes, if I'm correct. Okay, cool. So that brings me to the final part of my story, which is really focused on environmental health monitoring. And if you were to look at the 670 nanometer band of satellite images of the Earth, you would see some really beautiful photoluminescence that's coming from phytoplankton in the ocean. And phytoplankton um, are essentially uh, algae that have roughly about 500 genes, 3,000 proteins, and 200 metabolites. They're responsible for more than half of the world's oxygen production, and they also cycle most of the nutrients that we have on planet Earth. And yet, the toxins produced by these algae also are a significant health and economic problem. And just in the Bay Area a few weeks ago, we had a toxic algae bloom um, that killed uncountable numbers of fish um, in the Bay Area. And I thought there was this really interesting article from the SF Gate that mentioned we've never seen this before and even the models that have been developed to understand phytoplankton nutrient cycling and harmful algae blooms didn't see this as being possible. So climate change is causing enormous challenges on the health of our ocean and climate resilience and in particular our ability to monitor um, not only the health of phytoplankton which are so critical for um, kind of CO2 reduction and oxygen production um, but also can have harmful effects um, on our natural water supplies. So what our lab is trying to do is um, better correlate the presence and concentration of phytoplankton along with its metabolic function, including which metabolites it's excreting to be able to better predict not only the um, physical location of phytoplankton, but its nutrient cycling to understand if there might be a potential harmful algae bloom that's too early to detect but still would cause toxin levels in the water.
And if you think about how environmental monitoring is done now in the ocean, it's pretty old fashioned. Just Nalgene bottles are taken out on ocean vessels. The water is collected and then it's brought back to a central laboratory. And the sample is processed using techniques like mass spectrometry or an ELISA type assay in a 96 well plate to identify which proteins are present. And yet we know from the pandemic that optical approaches and nanophotonic approaches have a lot of promise for kind of miniaturized, rapid, and point-of-care sensing. Um, and for example, if you've used the SARS-CoV-2 like antigen tests, we know they don't have the highest sensitivity, but they do provide rapid readout, usually in about 15 minutes, of whether or not an antigen is present based upon how gold nanoparticles are binding. So when the gold nanoparticles aggregate together, you get a wavelength shift that can tell you about the concentration of a particular antigen or biomarker. So in our case, what we wanted to do is um, allow for in situ or in vivo deployment of these sensors of ocean health, um, but do so in a way that is more sensitive, so that way we could be able to detect, say, the uh, nanomolar concentrations of metabolites that would be present in the ocean. And the sensors that you used at home have low sensitivity in part because the scattering wavelength of the nanoparticles that's used is so broad. So I'll call this a low quality factor. Basically, the resonance has a very broad full width half max. So it means that whenever there's a biomarker in the surrounding and you start getting kind of changes in the environment that change the spectrum, you have pretty low sensitivity. Whereas if you contrast that with a high quality factor structure that has a much sharper resonance, um, then you can get much more sensitive detection because now when there's just one or a few analytes binding, your change in intensity as you go from on resonance to off resonance is much more significant. So how can we design a high quality factor sensor? What we do is we take basically slabs of silicon and then we illuminate them with normal incidence light. And if you're just illuminating them from the top, you'd expect to get fabry prototype resonances within the length of the silicon blocks. And that's going to give rise to a pretty normal looking scattering spectrum that by no means has a high quality factor associated with it. So how can we take kind of all the infrastructure of CMOS compatible processing and add in that high quality factor? Well, what we do is we utilize the fact that silicon also has a waveguide mode that it can support. So we have a guided mode resonance and unfortunately, this waveguide mode can't be excited by normally incident light. But what you can do is slightly vary the width of each structure so that way normally incident light now can couple into that waveguided mode. And keep in mind that that waveguided mode essentially has a quality factor of infinity, so extremely high. So based upon the perturbation um, size between each of the neighboring blocks, now you can get electric field enhancements that are 100 or 1,000x more that of the incident light. And that gives rise to an extremely sharp resonance in the scattering spectrum. So here, so sharp, it just looks like a line has been drawn. Um, the quality factor of this particular resonance is on the order of about 10,000. So depending upon your delta D or the difference between D2 and D1, like I said, you can get quality factors in the tens or hundreds of thousands. And we're able to use that for extremely sensitive detection. And because each of our antennas scatters like a dipole in a very controllable fashion, we can also do pixelated detection for multiplexing. So here's a schematic of how our structures work. We essentially have these pixelated, high quality factor structures um, that allow for targeted detection based upon the chemical functionalization that is on each pixel. So we can use our bioprinter to print down chemical functionalization over each antenna the total length of each nano antenna shown here is L is about um, 20 total microns. Um, the distance or diameter is about one micron across. And then we flow in our sample, in most cases ocean water samples, and then we can detect the presence of um, gene fragments, proteins, or metabolites over each pixel just using a CCD imaging camera. And just to put this sort of sensor in the context of many other beautiful sensors that have been developed in the past decades, if you look at plasmonic sensors, they have beautiful kind of spatial or diffractive control. They scatter quite a bit like dipoles, so that allows for kind of more easy multiplexing. If you want to get to highly sensitive detectors, that's usually where you want to have those high quality factors, which essentially amount to temporal control. How long can you trap light within your resonator? And where our sensor works is it basically has a high quality factor, not quite as high as some of the photonic crystals or ring resonators, 
But alongside that high quality factor, we also get extremely high spatial control to the far field. And that's what gives us the ability to do highly multiplex detection, as well as um, large area CMOS compatible fabrication in a lightweight form factor that's suitable for kind of uh, deployment into the field, like in the ocean. So here are some full field simulations of the electromagnetic field intensity. You can see the E field is amplified by more than 2000 X. So unlike PCR or culturing, we're not amplifying the sample. Here we're just amplifying the light to be able to do highly sensitive detection. And then because of the miniaturized size of each of our sensors, on a centimeter square, square footprint, we can fit over 3 million sensors. So if any of you have done biological measurements, this is equivalent to over 31,096 well plates. So if you were just going to use conventional microbiology methods, it would take you the size of a basketball court to do the same number of assays. And then what we can do is either use a tunable laser or hypospectral imaging to image each of these sensors simultaneously. So here we have different sensors that are lighting up at different frequencies. And then by looking at each different wavelength, we can basically reconstruct the sensor um, spectrum. So I mentioned that we can take different sensors and use our bioprinter essentially to functionalize them with distinct um, molecules that are sensitive. Here's just one example since we only have about five more minutes where we have a thiolated DNA probe that was complementary to the target nucleic acid. In this case, we had selected a target nucleic acid from SARS-CoV-2, kind of inspired by our colleagues who were doing wastewater monitoring um, with PCR, but were suffering from inhibition. And then we put our sensor into a flow cell. When we add the target, um, here one nanomolar of the target spiked in. You can see that within about five minutes of adding the target, we get a complete wavelength shift. And keep in mind here that we're measuring hundreds of resonators simultaneously. That's what's giving rise to the spread in spectrum. And this works in actual clinical and field samples. So here, for example, are nasal pharyngeal swabs, where when you put in the negative control, you get no shift. When you put in the positive control, you get a shift. And if we want to have optimal sensitivity, we found that we actually needed to optimize the aptamers that were put on the surface. Some of our original aptamers had these like loops that were forming, which reduced our sensitivity. Um, but with um, kind of our new probes, we're able to get uh, sub-picometer resolution, in fact, down to femtometer, uh, femtomolar rather, resolution and sensitivity. So uh, I mentioned kind of at the beginning, we're interested in looking not only at environmental DNA, but also uh, metabolites to be able to detect uh, harmful algae blooms. So with that kind of sub nanomolar scale sensitivity, what we're able to do is develop linkers on the surface that would be selective to uh, microcystin, one of the most common marine um, toxins that comes from phytoplankton. And we can do direct detection now of these small molecule metabolites with these really sensitive uh, detectors. And then tying this back to some of the original work I showed on Raman, if you're not able to develop a particular um, surface probe for the molecule you want to look at, you can also do untargeted detection or kind of unbiased detection where you just have a generalizable binder or a non-specific binder that allows anything to bind to the surface. And then when you're on the resonance of the high quality factor, you can basically detect if there's binding and then you use Raman scattering of whatever is bound to be able to identify it. So here's Raman spectroscopy of a monolayer of proteins that has landed on our resonators. And we've been able to do this now basically to sequence a whole variety of proteins that have landed on the surface by virtue of knowing the unique Raman scattering signature of each amino acid that comprises that protein. So this is now part of a spin-out company from my lab called Pumpkin Seed, where we're doing protein sequencing, um, including looking at the amino acid composition and the post-translational modifications by combining high-Q resonance uh, resonators with vibrational spectroscopy. And then on the uh, ocean monitoring front, we're taking these high-Q sensors and we're placing them on autonomous underwater vehicles that have been developed by um, NOAA, as well as Monterey Bay Aquarium, so that way can, they can do in-situ detection of the phytoplankton, which we know has a known Raman signature, the environmental DNA, um, and also the microcystin. Um, so they have a really powerful um, environmental sample processor that basically takes the ocean water, somewhat purifies it, so that way it's able to be handled by our chip. And then you can see um, basically our chip there, which can sit on PCB board, so that way you can do combination of like optical readouts and electrical readouts for in-situ ocean monitoring. So that brings me to the last slide of my presentation. 
Um, like I said, I shared with you three vignettes. I know it was a lot to take in, especially since we didn't have dessert, but hopefully you'll walk away with um, the conclusion that nanophotonics, I think, has a place in the microbiology lab and also in the field. Um, I tried to share with you a combination of both hardware and software um, spanning applications in pathogen identification, especially bacterial identification and drug susceptibility testing in um, measuring forces and mechanotransduction, and then also in detecting nucleic acids and metabolites. And if you're interested in a postdoc, feel free to send me an email. In terms of future work, we're really excited to use light to dynamically monitor drug cell interactions, as well as cell-cell interactions and antibody um, or protein interactions. And I'd like to thank uh, all of my students and postdocs, uh, without whom this work would not have been possible. Um, they have caused an incredible uh, shift, <laughs> I think, in terms of how we're doing microbiology with nanophotonics. Um, and of course, thanks to Jorge for such a great conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was better than dessert, for sure. <laughs> And we have time for questions. Yes, please. Thank you, Jennifer, for an excellent talk. Uh, I'm wondering about this uh, pressure sensor. Uh, did you check that? Um, uh, whether these uh, spectral properties that we interpret as a, a force uh, comes out from uh, aggregation of nanoparticles or particles that uh, can act as kind of internal filter where the emission of erbium is absorbed by outer layers of aggregated samples and this is kind of misinterpretation. Uh, did you check for that? Yeah, it's a really great question and um, it's part of the reason why uh, Jason developed the particles he did. So definitely go to his talk, but what Jason did is develop these um, kind of a polymeric or polystyrene microbeads where the upconverting nanoparticles sit generally without aggregation kind of throughout each microbead. And what he can do is press on it in the atomic force microscope and kind of compare before and after statistically, like are the particles aggregating and to what extent the changes in spectra that he's seeing are coming from the particles themselves or the particles aggregating. So in that particular case, I think I'll share some of this work. I think the force response comes from two things. First of all, the uh, lanthanide ions themselves and how they're interacting with the D metals are giving rise to a color change. But then also with applied pressure, you're changing the um, kind of vibrational modes of the polystyrene. So those are going into and out of resonance essentially with some of the uh, vibrational modes of the erbium. So if you take out the D metal, you can basically look at how the erbium couples to some of the vibrational modes of the polymer. So long story short, I guess after about five years, I can say for sure the forces that we're seeing in the worm are not due to aggregation, but it's definitely something that you want to make sure that you're kind of controlling for with these shelling strategies. Thank you very much. Uh, very beautiful work. I was a bit uh, confused in the first part. Um, I wasn't sure whether what you're showing was, was Raman or surface enhanced Raman. And in the later case, what was the substrate? In, in a slide I saw with nano rods, but I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, okay, great question. And sorry, I had I'd kind of skipped over the details there. So in the initial work we did um, with the 31 species and strains, um, it wasn't so much SIRS, we were just using a, a unroughened gold substrate, and the gold substrate there basically about 2x the signal that we were getting. In the bioprinting case, we do use SIRS, um, where we're using gold nanorods basically that we can co-print along with the blood samples that have the bacteria in it to enhance the sample. And then in the last part of our presentation, I showed how some of these silicon substrates can also be used as SIRS platforms to basically have more uniform field distributions. But, of course, attend Lewis's talk on uh, Thursday or Friday if you want to learn more about SIRS as one of the pioneers of the field. Okay. There is time for one more question, I was told. If nobody, I have one. And also looking at your, the, the part with these different species and bacteria that you used, and some of them, it seemed it was always the same type that were the troublemakers. And do they have anything in common, or do you know why they were so hard to predict with machine learning? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, there are a couple of reasons why there are certain bacteria that are easier or harder to differentiate. 
Um, first of all, bacteria fall into like two broad classes, like gram-negative and gram-positive. So I showed the differences between the eukaryotic and the prokaryotic cells. Those are very different because even structurally they're very different. When you compare within bacteria gram-positive versus gram-negative, those are also quite different and kind of easy to classify. Once you start looking at, for example, um, methicillin, methicillin resistant versus susceptible, you know, uh, Staph aureus, Basically, it's just a single genetic difference between both of those, and that obviously has kind of uh, you know, transcriptional differences in terms of the proteins that are being expressed, but it's probably a smaller number of proteins that are changing on the cell wall that are giving rise to more subtle differences, and that's where just having kind of more examples of single cell spectra or longer Raman integration times can help elucidate what those differences are. Okay, thank you. All right, so then um, let's thank Jen again for the wonderful presentation.